to Bauda and Len and what she had created for the children of Harlem. Our culture values neither the historical importance of doll play nor the home and creative at home work of women in color as activities worthy of humanist scholarship. But what Aunt Len put into collecting, researching, and contextualizing her dolls was scholarship. It still is scholarship. We call on each of you tonight to help Alva and Paulette resuscitate Aunt Len's vital and indispensable life's work. It's an imperative for the greater common good. It's an exquisite pleasure and a privilege to have worked the past year with artist Alva Rogers and scholar Dr. Paulette Richards, who trained as an academic researcher and teacher. Dr. Richards has been Fulbright Scholar in Senegal, a New York City Public Library Fellow, and received a 2021 Doris Duke Foundation grant to pursue her work focused on bringing the history and culture of Africans in diaspora to the fore. Alba Rogers is an artist and dramatist based in New York City. She's got three master's degrees, a Bessie, and has received grants from Rockefeller Foundation and the Jim Henson Foundation, among others. 2023 is going to be big for Alva. Julian Roman, her most recent play, will be produced at the Tank Theater in NYC, and an, adapt and an adaptation of her the doll plays will be presented at Franklin Furnace's sister organization, Dixon Place. Not only that, Alva Rogers will be soloing at MoMA in February. <laughs> She's here with us now. So toot sweet, I'm out of here. And you have Dr. Paulette Richards and Alva Rogers. Thank you. So I think I was supposed to start by um, indicating how it was that I met Alva. I was co-curator with Dr. John Bell at the Ballard Institute and Museum of Puppetry at the University of Connecticut on an exhibit called Living Objects, African-American Puppetry. Alva heard about this exhibit and she thought about submitting some of her puppets or other work, but because she's always been an avant-garde playwright, she wasn't sure whether her work fit into the rubric of puppet. Um, we tend in the puppet world to draw a line between dolls and puppets, but I am a doll person. And so I've been troubling that line since I got involved in puppetry. And so I was really happy to encounter Alva's work and invited her to submit a script for inclusion in the exhibit catalog, since I wanted to showcase play or performing objects that were written by African-American artists. I subsequently received a grant from Heather Henson to develop a critical analysis of Alva's work. Alva's plays have consistently pushed the boundaries of mimetic representation by mixing live actors and puppet and doll characters. And so mimesis or how art represents life and um, what is reality and through whose eyes is going to be one of the themes of our talk today. So, Alva, are we starting the slide presentation or do you want me to go on my Mises now? Because before there was a slide that had it further down in the deck. All right. Uh, if you'd like to continue with my Mises a little bit, we can do that. Now. Okay. All right. So as I said, mimesis refers to the way that art imitates life. A work of art can draw audiences into a vision of the world that is much starker than reality. And the world that we live in now sometimes makes it seem like that would be hard to do. Um, we call those kinds of worlds dystopias. 
or it can invite them to participate in an enchanted landscape that does not follow the laws of physics. So a artist can create a world where everyone can magically fly. And because we want to participate in that vision, we suspend disbelief. Dolls exist in what has been called the uncanny valley because they appear lifelike and yet we know they are not living beings. And so um, I remember going to a doll show and being freaked out by the reborn dolls. These are artists who create baby dolls that look so real that you get, wait a minute, <laughs> um, <laughs> that's the uncanny valley. So some people find dolls disturbing for that reason. And yet in many cultures around the world, dolls function as ritual objects that enable devotees to engage with the world of spirit. In traditional African societies, dolls could move fluidly between functioning as ritual objects or as playthings. In the US, this capacity appeared threatening to slaveholders who, who regarded ritual dolls as heathen idols. There's something in the Ten Commandments about not venerating heathen idols and the Puritans were pretty um, strict on that. So although the WPA narratives record many instances of formerly enslaved people describing dolls that they own, African-Americans capacity to make the kind of figures that had served as ritual objects in Africa was restricted under slavery. So the masks that were part of large spectacle dramas and some of the figurative sculptures that would have been placed in temples or other sacred spaces that those were like, no, no, we can't have that here. You're not making that. So um, African-Americans capacity to make the kind of figures was restricted. And alongside this grew up stereotypes about dolls like voodoo dolls that reflect a fear of black people, particularly black women using dolls to empower themselves. So tonight is a story about how Lennon Hoyt Holder used dolls to empower herself and her community. Whether a doll is believed to have spiritual power or not, the ability to present oneself and one's worldview in a figurative object is empowering. We're always talking these days about, I want to see myself, I need to see myself. Um, and for a long period of time, black children had limited opportunity to do that in their play because black dolls were not manufactured for them. African-American doll collectors like Aunt Len have labored to open the vistas of imagination by presenting young minds with dolls that represent the whole human family. And later we'll be talking about the importance of Aunt Len's collection um, including dolls of many different ethnic backgrounds, not just black dolls or just white dolls. Okay, Alva, are we ready to move into the slide? Yes, yes we're ready. Okay, here we go. Okay, I'd like to um, begin by just lighting a candle for Lennon Holder Hoyt. And I just want to have a moment of silence to honor her memory. Thank you. So now that she's in the room with us, let's continue. Next slide, please. Okay, I, I really want to just bring your attention to her, her educational background and her professional, professional affiliations, um, just to dispel any idea that you might consider that she is just 
was just a a, a crazy woman <laughs> who collected dolls. So she received a, her a high school degree in 1930 from New York Teachers Training School, and I recently found out just a couple of days ago that that training school was in the same location as the high school that I went to on the city college campus. So she went to high school where the music and art was formed, conceived. And then she received her BS in art and education in 1937. She received a, an equivalent, of, she received a teaching certificate from in special education from Teachers College, Columbia, and the equivalent of a PhD from CUNY in 1959. Now she was on the advisory board of Harlem Hospital for about 10 years, and she was a member of St. Philip's Episcopal Church in Harlem, and members of, she had membership in various doll clubs, national doll clubs, and she was member of the Phi Delta Kappa sorority, that was an, an educator's sorority for black women, and she ran the sorority as you can see in 1953. That's what the term first basilisk means. And um, may I have the next slide, please? So here we have Lennon Holder Hoyt in her, one of the main galleries in the museum. Next slide, please. So, Lennon Hoyt, and she was affectionately known as Aunt Len, uh, married Louis P. Hoyt, a pharmacist, in 1938, and they purchased a home on Hamilton Terrace. And this is her block. This was her block. And Hamilton Terrace, um, and for those of you who don't know much about New York City um, architecture or urban design, you know, cul-de-sacs and terraces and places, PL, those are locations where you're going to have, well, they're kind of, they're insulated, number one. So Hamilton Terrace is insulated between St. Nicholas uh, Terrace and Convent Avenue. So then you had very gentried uh, folks living on this uh, terrace block in Harlem, and I, you can, this, this is analogous to Sutton Place on the Upper East Side. Next slide, please. Now, what do Thurgood Marshall, Richard Wright, Ralph Ellison, W.E.B. Du Bois have in common with Lennon Holder Hoyt? Just think about that for a minute. Besides, the color of their skin. Next slide, please. St. Philip's Episcopal Church, located at 215 133rd Street in Harlem. They were all parishioners at St. Philip's Episcopal Church. Next slide, please. Now the Lafargue Clinic, which was the first mental health clinic in Harlem, was located in the parish basement. And it was founded in 1946 by psychiatrist Frederick Wortham, novelist Richard Wright, staff writer of Life magazine Earl Brown, and Reverend Shelton Hale Bishop, rector of St. Philip's Episcopal Church. Now, I've come to find out that uh, Reverend Shelton Hale Bishop was one of the main architects of, of Harlem and the social, the social fabric and life for the well-being of black Americans in Harlem. He petitioned the city government for parks to be you know, designed and built and added to Harlem, among other things. And they really, um, so that's Linda Adrian. So um, its mission was to concentrate on the mental health of children 
as it was determined that discrimination and segregation induced mental disturbances in black children and adults. And, now this is how we connect Thurgood Marshall. Data in doll tests from Lafargue were cited in a court decision to integrate schools in Wilmington, Delaware, and later in Brown versus Board of Education, which ruled that separate and black, separate black and white schools were unconstitutional. I just discovered this about Aunt Len and about this clinic a couple of days ago. Paulette and I were just, we just couldn't believe it. It's almost like it was in plain sight all these years, but we just decided to, oh, I, I said, oh, is, I'm not familiar with St. Philip's. Let's see if it still exists. And then they had a Wikipedia page, and then we found out about all the parishioners, and then we started connecting the dots. <laughs> Aunt Len was a mental health worker way before she <laughs> opened her museum. She was working uh, using dolls and puppets in a healing capacity long before uh, the museum had opened. Next slide, please. So here's Dr. Wortham and several children in a playroom therapy session. Next slide. This is Aunt Len. Next slide, please. Yes, so not only was she a mental health worker, she was an advocate along with those other historical characters. And incidentally, you know, it made me think, wow, um, Richard Wright took his family to Paris. W.E.B. Du Bois took his family to Ghana, West Africa. Ralph Ellison became uh, kind of very reclusive. He had so much anxiety and regarding, um, I mean, racism had such a, an effect on him. If you've ever, if you haven't read Invisible Man, I urge you all to read it. And in fact, he was a patient of Dr. Wertheim because he had his extreme anxiety was induced when he was um, asked to be a, a, to join the war as a soldier. And he did not want to join, in his words, the Jim Crow Army. So Richard Wright, who was also in psychotherapy, he made an arrangement for him to, to start seeing Dr. Wertheim. So this was a serious business. Mental health was a serious business. And, and it still is a serious business. Next slide, please. Paulette, before we move on, would you like to chime in on any of that section? Yes, I just want to underline that as we saw in uh, uh, Lennon Hoyt Holder's credentials, that she was an art teacher and that she had a certificate in special education. And so now we have a, a lead that needs to be researched further because um, most likely she was using techniques of art therapy or play therapy with her students um, long before we started to call them those things. Um, and so she had this insight that art and doll play or puppet play, because we know that she did make puppets and use them with her classes as well. She had this insight that this could be beneficial for her students' development. So now we are going to just talk a little bit about Aunt Len's uh, Doll and Toy Museum in Harlem and the doll place. Next slide, please. So I absolutely adore this photograph. Um, it's actually a postcard. It's one of two postcards that Aunt Len gave me um, during our last visit together. And this, and as you, when we get to the, when we get to the next slide, you'll see that 
she this is carefully curated this table and these dolls around the table and the setting and um, I decided when I was I carried these cards with me when I was at Brown I decided that I would this would be a prototype of a uh, of one of the scenes in the play. And this is called, next slide please. And the tea table ensemble. And so she describes the, what the table is actually made of. And also, as you can see in the descriptions of the dolls, um, they're always referred to, you, you get to know the country that they're from, the company that made them. So the black doll is called the Black Steiner because there's a, a German doll company called Steiner. And they made them some exquisite looking uh, black dolls with beautiful eyes and porcelain um, bodies. And so this other one is a handwork. And so she, each doll has a toy. And Aunt Lem believed that like every doll in her collection had to be completely outfitted to be you know, correct. And, and in this case, they also had to have a toy because they were going to a tea party. And so, and can we go back to the slide just so you can take a look at that again? Yeah, you see the, the doll over here in the foreground. She's got a little bunny. There's a couple of other, the black doll has a bunny. They all have bunnies and, and so forth. So uh, next slide, please. And oh, you wait. see there's, I'm sorry? Yeah, we were going to emphasize here too that um, the black doll has yes. us at the table on a plane of equality with the other dolls. That's right. And there is, I play with that also in that particular scene in the play. Um, so, and you see there's, a, there's the, uh, the, the address of the museum and her phone number. Next slide, please. So in this area, she had lots of baby dolls and they were all in buggies and all the buggies were um, antiques. And you can see there are lots of antique quilts and such and um, bonnets. And there's a, there's a black uh, baby doll in the foreground there. And as you can, if you can see, this wooden thing, her house was filled with, you know, the moldings. It was just a, an exquisite um, house with, and it, which had a dumb waiter, which still went from, you know, it worked. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. Here we go. Baby dolls on parade in antique buggies. Black modern doll made in Germany. She accompanied me on my trip in 86. A black closed mouth baby doll, two Hilders. So these are all very notable, uh, rare dolls. All the dolls mentioned on this postcard. Next slide, please. Uh, so here is a reproduction. We did a took a photograph of the catalog, the Sotheby's sale catalog of her collection. And the collection, I mean, the collection was sold on Friday, December 16th, 1994. Did you want to say anything uh, here, um, Paulette? Um, yeah, just to underscore that um, when we get to the inside of the catalog, do we have some slides with that? We just have a couple. Okay, yeah. But the inside of the catalog is further documentation of Aunt Len's work as a scholar. Yeah. Because um, she was able to assemble the information on all of these dolls. Um, although she was part of a black elite and she and her husband had the means to purchase a nice home, they were not wealthy per se. So her ability to assemble this collection uh, came down to her ability and her knowledge of which dolls had value. So that when she went to flea markets and other places, she often found overlooked treasures. Yes. And she was able to identify 
exactly what the doll was rather than going to an antique dealer and buying them, you know, sold as antique dolls with a provenance. Yeah. Next slide, please. So now we're going to look at, we'll see the origin story of the doll plays. Um, I think before we start this section of, this, of the presentation, I would just like to tell you that there was a central image in the play that was based on an actual experience that I had with Aunt Len during one of our last visits. And I wasn't alone on this visit. I was accompanied by a friend, her name is Jennifer Good. And um, Jennifer was the a co-owner with her brother of a, a club downtown called MLK and she was a collector herself paintings and such and she was very eager to meet Aunt Len. Now when we went this was during the time that before ATMs and so I'm just going to tell you that Jennifer happened to have her checkbook on her on this particular day so Aunt Len was all, she's always very happy to take someone new through the collection. And so while Jenny and I were there, one of her pipes burst and Aunt Len, um, she didn't have a checkbook or she didn't have cash on her. She didn't have a way of paying the plumber that day. And so, but Jennifer put her at ease. She was because she just was so upset that the, the water was going to get down to the to, down to the lower floors and and just destroy her collection. And Jennifer was able to put her at ease and said, "Don't worry. Just call the call the call the plumber, and everything will be okay." And so um, so that was uh, that day. That image stuck with me. And so in the play. The play begins with, uh, we hear a trickle of water, and you hear this little trickle of water throughout the play, and by the end, it becomes the flood. Um, and I don't want to say too much about that, because I'll tell you a little bit more about that later, but, but at the beginning of the play, Aunt Len is dying, and the dolls realize that she's leaving this world, and they don't want her they don't want the outside world to take her and turn her to dust. So they figured out that they've got to keep her in their world, and in order to do that, they have to turn her into a doll. So throughout the course of the play, we find out about how many of the dolls came to the museum, how they, be, how they became a member of Aunt Len's family, doll family, and, and how they make the magic to turn her into a doll by the end. Next slide, please. So uh, as, as uh, Harley Spiller said earlier, I decided that I would write um, this as my graduate thesis, and this was the invitation. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So, I, about a year ago, I was able to find um, the videotape from this graduate thesis reading at Brown. And so I made some uh, um, camera grabs <laughs> with the video, from the video. And so this is actually the actor who played, she was playing Aunt Len. And this, and my, my the Brown production, I was working with Heather Henson and Holly Laws, great sculptor, puppet builder, amazing artist. Heather Henson, amazing artist, puppet builder, puppeteer. And the, th the three of us set out to build the look of this world. And um, so yeah, Heather made this replica of her limestone out of a cardboard box. Next slide, please. Okay, this is Aunt Len and three members of the cast, three of the dolls from the collection. 
Next slide, please. So here, um, you can see there's a little tee set on the ground. We have, um, Paulette, would you like to talk about this scene? Sure. Um, so this is, is it early? And um, what is the, early is the black character, yes? Uh, yes. Um, and the white girl is, what's her name again? Well, actually, sitting next to early, no, this is actually the infinite diminution scene where they're on the train. Okay. So then Isana Walker is, she's puppeteering and being the voice of the conductor. And so Aunt Len and Brown Nurse Doll are on the train going to DC to a doll show. And that, it looks a lot similar to another scene. Uh, because it's dark, it's hard to, to see the characters with all the, the similar wigs. But the conductor is actually a silhouette, a puppet, a shadow puppet that was designed and made by Kara Walker. And so were the black and white masks. Those are also made by Kara Walker. Next slide, please. Oh, well, why, why don't you give us the tea about how you pulled that off? How did you get a, such a phenomenal artist as Kara Walker to contribute puppets to your show? Uh, well, um, I actually, I, 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 ha I have a friend who's here tonight, her name from Toronto, and her name <laughs> is Deirdre Haskell. And um, she was living in Toronto with us. She, I mean, sorry, she was living in Providence too. Um, she uh, was a mathematician and, and we were all new mothers. Deirdre, m myself, and Kara Walker. We were all new moms. And I forgot exactly who introduced Kara and I because we had babies and we were, we used to hang out with our kids and take them to places together. And when I was working on the thesis, I was telling her that I'm doing this and I would, and she just was said, oh, that sounds, Fun. I'd like to do that. I, I, th I have time to do that, and that's that's how that happened. And um, yeah, all in the timing. So um, that thesis production, unbeknownst to me at the time, there was a woman who she was a director of the New World Theater. Her name was Roberta Uno who I think might be at the Ford Foundation, or she was, I don't know if she's still there, but she invited the, me to bring the doll plays to New World Theater for a workshop production. And, you know, we packed it up and we, I mean, this was amazing because they had money to give us a whole building crew to build a costumer who just built these amazing costumes and the sets and Holly came and Heather came and we kept building and and we, we loaded up the Kara Walker shadow puppets and half the cast who were actors Brown Brown University students who were actors and many of them were not acting students they had different majors but they they came so let's take a look at this incarnation of the doll place. Next slide, please. Yeah, so the New World Theater at the University of Massachusetts is no longer in existence, sadly. Sad but true. And so we have Holly Laws in the back row. She's standing next to Heather. And, and there's our cast and um, I have to say that this rendition, this rendering of the show um, is my, my favorite um, because we had all the lights that we needed. We were able to make uh, certain levels and I, I think, you know, Heather and Holly, they just really, they really got, Heather made this incredible Bible and um, um, I'm trying to remember the, the term when you make a, 
storyboarding. <laughs> um, it, it was it, it was great. We were exhausted. We were just exhausted, but it was great. Next slide, please. Wait, 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 wait. Yes, yes, yes. One, one thing to point out here, um, and then we can talk more about the set design in subsequent slides. But on the the issue of mimesis. Mm -hmm. One of the challenges that the show presents to the audience's imagination is yeah. that you have live actors playing dolls and then they manipulate dolls, they animate dolls during the performance. So we have the doll that's manipulating a doll puppet. When you read the script flat, it can be hard to visualize how that will work on stage, but the audience response to the performances did show that people were willing and able to suspend disbelief. Yes? Yes. Enter into the world of the play. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Thank you. Yeah, so um, you see we have the the baby dolls, and there's a the the Grace Kelly doll, and then there's a the nurse doll, and here's a French fashion doll, and the antebellum quartet dolls. They were all rag dolls, and they're up on the platform above. And this uh, version of the play it came to my attention. See, we were, you know, we're all because the cast has the, the play has a cast of twelve. And I was trying in this case to do the show without having a separate actor portraying Grace Kelly doll and the antebellum misses. And so, so the, the distinction was made by the Grace Kelly just putting on a black lace frock over her wedding gown. And one of the comments that I received during this feat talk back after one of the performances was that was I trying to make a commentary on Grace Kelly was I suggesting that she was a racist and and I said oh no not at all not by any means at all I was just trying to um, be more economical um, so when, when the show was done the next times during the reading and in Atlanta we hired a, an actor, a separate actor, to, to play those roles. One uh, more thing to underline here, because I, I don't think we made this clear, is that the, char the doll characters in the play are modeled on dolls that were in Aunt Len's collection. Yes. And so the Grace Kelly doll was a doll that she displayed in her museum. Yes? Well, I don't know if she had a Grace Kelly per se, but she did have many celebrity dolls, and they were molded. Um, so, like she had like Judy Garland, for instance, and a, and a bunch of whole other, uh, many, many. But I don't know if she had Grace Kelly, but I decided when one night I was at working on a paper, and then I turned the TV on, and I saw one of those E documentaries about Grace Kelly. And, and they interviewed a lot of her old friends from Philadelphia. And they all said basically how Grace really wanted to go back to being an actress. And she didn't necessarily like being a princess. It was very isolating. And so I thought then this would be just her life story encapsulated as a doll in a tower and with the prince throwing away all her Hollywood clothes and he locked them in a trunk. That's what, that's what Grace Kelly says. He, and he locked them in a trunk and he says, you may never wear those clothes again. And so um, I, I, I thought that that worked very nicely actually. And I'm pretty sure that if Aunt Len, if, if there was a Grace Kelly doll, she would have had one. Yes. Okay. Next, Next slide. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
The play was actually produced in Atlanta at Actors Express Theater in 2002. And here was my cast. And uh, yeah. So here is where we can talk about um, the success of the play in engaging the audience in the world of the play and particularly the underlying spiritual or ritual significance. Because in this location, during the run of the show, people began bringing dolls and leaving them as offerings in the foyer of the theater, yes? Yes, mm -hmm. yes, this is true. And in fact, you know, I wasn't in Atlanta for the entire run of the show, but I was there for the opening, of course, and I went back for like the last few, um, for the last few uh, shows. And when I went <laughs> for the last shows, the, there was a mound of dolls that almost reached the ceiling. I, I, I was just stunned. It was, it was unbelievable. Um, yeah, um, and the, the audiences were of mixed cast, I mean, mixed ages, um, mixed races, and lots of doll people, but just lots of people who just had stories to tell and were very, they seemed to really jump on board. I was grateful for that. Next slide, please. Um, so you can see that this production looks a lot different from the University of Massachusetts production and from, um, the, um, from the, the Brown thesis, of course. This show, the play was in repertory with another play by another playwright. And so that when a show is in repertory, it, it often means that the two plays have to share the lighting plot. They have to share um, some of the set pieces. That, so you can't do too much to obstruct the set because there's a turnaround. So my show ran for four days a week and then the next weekend, the other show ran for four days. So we had to have that turnaround. So that there was a lot that I could not do in terms of the, the staging, the world, the plasticity of the play. And um, so but, that's... But let's talk about um, the acting. Oh. Now that we can see the bodies clearly here. Yeah. Um, that we can see that the actors had to adopt the attitudes of dolls and the movements of dolls. Yes, well, I had a lot, with, with, with all the productions, I was the doll body work instructor. Okay. Um, and I used a book by Brian, Brian's last name. Oh, the na the title of the book is "Doll Face Has a Party," and Brian has since written like his books have become incredible movies directed by um, wonderful directors. I'm just I'm so sorry I'm drawing a blank on his last name, and if someone can remember, and I know that you know Heather, so put his last name in the chat for me. Thank you. <laughs> Dollface has a party, and in Brian, Brian Selznick. Brian Selznick, thank you so much. Um, and so Dollface is a doll who wants to have a party, and she invites all of her friends in the household, and the friends are spoon and chair and fork, and they make she 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 baked cake, and so. In the story, we see how the doll and how she eats. So she might take a piece of cake, but then the cake gets smashed on the side of her face because 
She really can't open her mouth, you know? And when she folds her legs, you know, her feet are like all askew at her ankles. They're not like this, but they're like, you know, like her knees are kind of bent askew like a, like a, like a rag doll would. And so um, we did all these exercises with the actors so that each actor, I mean, sorry, each doll character, her body movement is informed by the, the material with which the doll is constructed. So the baby dolls with the bonnets, they are these, um, they're bisque dolls. So they're made of porcelain and, and bisque, which is a type of porcelain. And, uh, and they all have these, like, we put these sock, like, they look almost sort of like mittens on their hands so that the actors could move their fingers to make them more doll-like. And um, some of the dolls, some of the characters, some of the dolls had swivel heads. See, at the very beginning of the play, there's a scene called the procession. And each doll marches in and she, they introduce themselves and they tell you what they're made of and they say, oh, and I have a swivel head. And so some dolls can swivel. And then Army Talking Doll in particular, and I have a, I have a photograph of Thomas Edison's talking doll that Aunt Len had in her collection. And the doll has a metal torso, which you'll see later. But in the description of Army Talking Doll, Aunt Len, I created that Aunt Len gives her brown replacement skin and she gives her a blonde wig and she's got a, an army helmet because she's watching out for us and she, she knew, oh, she found her with re replacement brown skin because she thought that maybe there was a black family who, and this is, in, this is, my, this is my telling of this story. Um, uh, in, the, in the play Aunt Len thinks that a bl black, black mother must have found this talking doll and gave it replacement brown skin so that she could give it to her brown child. So yeah, so then we have the, the antebellum quartet and they're all rag dolls, so they're kind of floppy. So yeah, that, um, the, 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 the materials are very instructive on their movement and, and actions and their voices. They all have kind of like pull string voices. So the dialogue is all in verse, yeah. Great, we go to the next slide. So here is French fashion doll, and there's Grace Kelly doll. Next one. So this reading came after the production in Atlanta. Um, I'm trying to remember what um no actually i it may have come it may have it may have come first i i i, I can't remember right now okay sorry uh, you have yeah. you, you have an image of the performance right i have an image of not of the performance but of the act of the cast after yeah, the so meeting yeah nice. yeah next slide please oh uh, oh so yeah so then it was this was before the atlanta Production. So yeah, so Peter Dubois was the director. Um, this cast was made up of a lot of Juilliard actors. Um, the three women uh, to my left were Juilliard actors, and there's a Yaley, um, and uh, Peter and Tanya. Yeah. And then in the in the other reading, you have an even more illustrious cast member. Yes. Show that yes. Slide. Next slide. Classical Theater of Harlem in residence at the Schomburg Research Library. We had a staged reading there. Next slide, please. And Aunt Len was portrayed by American master Carmen de Lavalade. This was such an honor and such an amazing treat. Um, she was just the ideal Aunt Len. Um, 
she really wanted to play this role. Um, she felt like it was in her. She knew Aunt Len, she understood it. Um, sadly, the show, um, there, was a, there are a couple, there's one um, person from the Brown uh, uh, thesis, um, no, the, from the New World Theater production, who was also in this uh, reading. And um, yeah, I, what a, a remarkable person. And I, I bumped into her son a couple of times and he told me that she, 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 she spoke about the play and the character so much to Leo and that she really wanted to do it. And I, I think you all know that she's been, um, she has uh, Alzheimer's now. So yeah. sadly that won't be able to happen. But, um I wanted to interject here that um, Carmen de Lavalade and her husband, Jeffrey Holder, had a large collection of figurative objects that ran the gamut from African masks to mechanical figures to dogs. So you were really speaking her language. You know, I didn't, I didn't know that, but... Um... Yeah, that was, uh, I'll never forget it. <laughs> I'm so sorry I didn't, it wasn't videotaped. Um, next slide, please. So the serious business of doll play. So we did discuss a little, so it's a serious business. Um, and so now, Paulette, do you want to sort of introduce this next section and um, uh, and we are, this is a sort of a, this, this slide is a pre, prelude to an introduction to, to a book um, which we uh, have some images from by Robin Bernstein. So just to um, underscore that because dolls in our society have been associated mainly with girls, um, they had not received as much scholarly attention as other topics in the humanities, I'll put it that way. Now we have girlhood studies and we have researchers looking at how dolls contribute to children's formation of identity. But um, we're signaling once again here that in an African context, dolls had spiritual significance. So I'm gonna um, throw you a, a curveball and ask, while Aunt Len was an upstanding member of this Episcopalian church, did you get a sense from her that she also found a spiritual presence or a spiritual meaning in the dolls that she collected? Oh, most definitely. Um, and you know, and Aunt Len, was a very spiritual person. I, she, she, uh, she treated the dolls with like such reverence, mm -hmm. you know, and especially the very, the, those old handmade dolls by the enslaved peoples, you know, and, and whenever and some of those dolls were stolen at, well, at one point, and some of them were returned, and she's very happy when they were returned. Um, and she, I think that she knew that she was, that they were, they all embodied um, history. In, and uh, I mean, all objects do. And, um, we, 
I felt that I was in the presence of, you know, like I didn't want to leave. I never wanted to. I, it was, it's just an awe-inspiring uh, place uh, to be. Um, and uh, and I, 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 I really hope that everyone will leave here today just knowing, you know, what, what an intelligent and ro lively, filled with, you know, and um, caring, compassionate human being she was. Next slide, please. So I had already said my spiel about uh, my medic challenges. So we can go to the next slide and maybe I could leave this in as um, applied theory. So this is the scene where Aunt Len is where the doll, no, this is, what is this? This is the scene where the doll collector comes yes. for tea. Mm -hmm. And it's, this, it's the first time or the second time he comes and he promised, she tells him the only, there's a caveat when you come to visit me, you may never talk about buying any of my dolls. Mm -hmm. We can have show and tell, but you cannot talk about buying any of them. And as the scene goes on, he sl tries slipping it in. And every time he makes a mention of that, all the dolls in the collection, they start to whisper to her and tell her, tell him to leave now, Mama Len. And then he starts to tell her, you know, but what will happen to you? What will happen to your collection when you're gone? You're not going to live forever. You will turn to dust. So um, by the end, she's, she's just had it with him and she stands up and she tells him to leave and the dolls do too. So I think this is where we had three images from yes. different productions to contrast what they yeah. were left. So this was your brown one. And then the next slide, please, is what it looked like at the New World Theater, where the dolls in the back on the upper level are listening into the conversation and advising Aunt Lynn as you mentioned, to get this guy out of the house. And I think in we can in the context that you built around the play, as we'll get into deeper when we get to the flood, that him coming to visit Aunt Len and proposing a transaction, a sale, is almost like a slave trader coming to purchase people from a community, which was greatly feared mm -hmm. under slavery. Yeah, so next slide, please. So that's what it looked like at Actors Express. Mm -hmm. Do we go to the next scene? Yes, so everything is topsy-turvy. Topsy turvy dolls, and these are the. This is what we're going to see. We'll see Topsy spanking her doll in Uncle Tom's cabin, and the, all of my plays have an element of enchantment, which I I attempt to achieve by having a puppet, a doll, or an object of some sort. So let's go to the next slide, please. So in this case, you're kind of undoing a, a dark spell that was mm -hmm. cast or woven under slavery. Um, some in the audience may not be familiar with the history of the topsy-turvy dolls. Mm -hmm. um, the doll is usually a cloth figure, often handmade. And on one side would be a white face and body and on the other side would be a black face and body. And then the skirt covers the extra head. So you can flip it over and play with one character or the other. The historical record is thin on documentation. So we don't know for sure um, 
but there are stories that black children were prohibited from playing with dolls that represented which race it, or it you know in different versions it's a different race but in any mm -hmm. case to escape censure you could quickly flip the doll over and then everything looks hunky dory mm -hmm. another um historical background on these dolls is they became popular again in the 1920s when there was a pair of sisters who had a very famous act playing Topsy and Eva and one sister would wear blackface as Topsy and the other sister would play little Eva and then there were dolls manufactured and mass marketed as Topsy and Eva. So go ahead. Uh, yeah, so, um, um, so I just want to draw your, your attention to the, to the text underneath the, the, the image. Mm -hmm. So this is a Raggedy Ann Mammy Topsy Turvy doll by Cotton Country Creations, KKK. So this was a white supremacist doll and toy company. And they made these objects and toys as tools with which, for which the, the young white children could learn how to treat black children, black slaves. Cotton Country Creations. Yeah. Next slide, please. Good. Um, yeah, so I'll just read this. In performance as Topsy, a black-faced actress, most likely a white girl, raises her hand to strike a black doll. So this is this is how they learned. This was this was taught. This was a learned behavior from very young and they used dolls to teach. Next slide. So I have this, I, 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 I introduce this in um, a series of scenes. I call them, I refer to these dolls because they're rag dolls as the, the antebellum quartet. And um, so there's Hannah and there's Early. Hannah is the slave mother and Early is her daughter. And there's the Mrs. And Sarah is, um, Early is assigned to take care of Sarah. She combs her hair. And so I, Sarah wants to know what Early dreams about. And so the, there are two scenes that unfold and one of them, but Early doesn't want to share her dreams. And she says, you know, I, I'm a slave girl and you know, I don't dream, I can't dream. I'm just a slave. And so, but she says, oh, don't you have, well, don't you dream, won't you, don't, won't you dream of your children? And she says, I don't dream of children. I'm just gonna be a slave and die. And then she says, oh, come on, you're my best friend. All girls dream of children. So then she makes her switch and she does this incantation to make her lose her sort of her awareness of where she is and who she is, what skin she's in. And she starts to reveal her dreams. And then she says, okay, stop. And then she brings her back. And then they switch places again. So then that happens again. And the next time, it doesn't have a happy ending. Um, we go to the next slide. Yes. We're on the next slide. Yeah. So, um, so those images are from Racial Innocence, Performing American Chi Girl Childhood from Slavery to Civil Rights by Robin Bernstein. And I want to tell you that um, Dr. Jennifer Brody, who's in the audience, she introduced me to this amazing book. Um, 
she's a professor at Stanford and she includes the doll plays in her um, syllabus and I went to speak there and she, the class was reading this so I read the book before I, I went there so I, I'm just, I can't, I keep going back to it. Uh, next slide please. Yeah, let's, let's move through that. Yes. We're running out of time. Yeah, so we're just, we're gonna just, you have the name of the book, we're gonna move on. Next slide, please. Yeah. So here, so then when I said when, it, when the same scene unfolds but differently, um, this is what happens to Early. Uh, Early gets, she's on the whipping post before her lynching. And the missus, she says she wants the whip, but then she makes her mother whip her instead of whipping her herself. And there's... But, mm -hmm. I think what we missed though in in this dark incantation mm -hmm. and what you... Oh yes, we did miss that. <laughs> unravel it or, or unwork it is that this topsy-turvy um, switching of places in that process early reveals that she is actually Sarah's Sarah's sister. Half, yes, half sister. Yeah. So that is the... what what drove the rage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. and she describes her mother's rape mm -hmm. as well in the dream, yes. and yeah. it's all it's all over then. Yeah. So I think we're right at seven fifteen. So we just have a few slides left. Let's move to the next slide. Many thousands gone. So this loops back into the flood mm -hmm. that um, what what uh, Alva did with the the plumbing incident in Aunt Len's house is to imagine the flood as the middle passage. And all through the play, Army Talking Doll shows up at different points and just announces numbers. And at first, the audience doesn't know why she has these numbers, but they're continually increasing. And in this scene, it becomes clear that what she's counting is the number of people lost in the flood. Mm -hmm. And in the far background, you can see the mermaid shadow puppets that Carol Walker made that represent the people who fell or were tossed overboard from the slave ships and now live in the bottom of the ocean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We go to the next slide. That's the army talking doll. So we put a, like, we put a sort of a, a console that's attached to her and she has a microphone. So everything, all her, um, she's always amplified. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah. And the next, next slide. Mm -hmm. Oh, so here, there's a, there's an army, there's a, there's a copy of um, Edison's talking doll. That's what the actual, this was in Aunt Len's collection. And these are a couple of dolls. There were hundreds. <laughs> Stunning, but that's what a talking mechanical doll. And it was also jointed. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Next. Next slide. Okay. Ooh, we're, can we do this really fast? Yeah, we're going to do this really fast. <laughs> yeah. So as we as as we have been highlighting all along that um, in traditional African perceptions, dolls are ritual objects or can be ritual objects as well as playthings. And you have indicated that Aunt Len did have a sense of spiritual presence or meaning about the dolls in her collection. Um, and I think that's connected to the healing that she was trying to bring, you know, the healing to the psyches of children by opening the realm of imagination, by giving them representations of themselves and just making it safe for them to play. So next slide, please. So in the end, as Alva has indicated, the dolls realize that Aunt Len is about to make the transition between the material world and the spirit world. 
And so they turn her into a doll so that she will reside with them instead of turning to dust. And then Next slide. Last, last slide. Yeah, that this is that ritual taking place in the um, the Mass Providence production. No, the um, Amherst, Massachusetts. Oh, the Amherst. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the last slide, Aunt Len has literally become a doll. Next slide, please. So, Harley, back to you. Thank you, Paulette. Wow. Thank you very much, Alva Rogers, for your work, for your courage. Dr. Paulette Richards, for your brains and kindness and friendship with Alva. We you guys did a fabulous job there there are comments but there are not questions in the room because i think you've covered a lot but i have one question and i hope it's appropriate alva alva rogers has many talents she teaches children and she has as you just witnessed, a very gentle and empathetic touch. And Franklin right. Furness is delighted that she works with us. And every time I, I, I go to see her in action, she doesn't stop teaching when the bell rings and the students are following her out the door. They, they don't let go. And I don't want to let go of Alva either but my my question you've been in you've been you're an actress and a playwright you have been in real serious plays and this is clearly a crucial part of your life and your work can you talk about your decision have you ever acted in the doll plays <laughs> Or, or can you talk about why you don't or wouldn't or couldn't or? Um, well, just quickly, I, I never wanted to, but I, it's a funny little story. I had to, when we did this show in Amherst, um, we wanted to record it. And so all the actors were, there was one actor who was a, an equity actor. The woman who played Aunt Len was an equity actor and she um, didn't want to be photographed. So I decided, I, I, in, order, in order to get some images taken of the production, I stepped in, I got in costume and everything, but I just had to um, do the whole play with the script. Now she did take the photographs there, but when we did the videotape, which we can't find, um, I had to step in and do that. Um, but I, I really didn't want to um, to act in it, and I I know that I've I just don't I just I it's not so, I don't it's, I don't think it's my my forte. <laughs> I. I have a follow-up and it, again, I hope it's okay to ask, but you, you mentioned your daughter and I wonder with all this knowledge in your brain and, and your heart, do you think watching her play with dolls as a child, was she inculcated to your way of thinking? Was she any different than other kids you saw play with? Does she have a head start on all this or? Oh my gosh. Uh, yes, <laughs> she, she, she would come to the, all the rehearsals. She memorized so many of those lines. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And I, she would play with her dolls and 
create scenarios and and she loved her brown dolls and she had you know white dolls brown dolls but she you know she was um it was really joyful <laughs> and uh, yeah thank you can can we go a little bit more vulnerable here okay there is one really beautiful story about you and your daughter and your dolls um there was a period when the lack of affordable housing in New mm -hmm. became a serious difficulty mm -hmm. while we're kind of couch surfing. Mm -hmm. And in order to make sure that your daughter had was grounded in a sense of home, mm -hmm. made a, like a shrine, basically. It was mm -hmm. a doll in a suitcase, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so that you all had that as your home space. Yes. Yeah. So we always traveled with our, with our dolls. I do see some questions over here. I'm gonna um, read Hi. a couple of them and please pick the one you want to answer um, or all of them maybe. I wonder if there is a sales record for the collection at Sotheby's that would tell who bought the dolls and if any parts of the collection are still together. That is the first one. I'm just going to do two more. Um, was Jeffrey Holder a relative per chance of Aunt Len? Yes, the black cameo is here. So fabulous. <laughs> and one more. Has this important material been included in the theater curriculum for high schools and undergraduate studies? Uh, OK. Um... Um, Aunt Len and Jeffrey Holder were not related, not not in that sense. Jeffrey Holder was from the Caribbean. Aunt Len is a African American. You know, she's a descendant of American Black people. Um, so the other question was, um, oh, the has it been included in theater curriculum for high schools and undergraduate study? Hi, Carol. Wonderful question. I, and thank you, Aunt Corrine, for your question. Um, Carol, the, the, the short answer is no. We do not have, we, uh, the doll place has not been published yet. So, um, so no, not yet. And was there another question? Um, I see. Um, there was one more about uh, who bought the collection and oh, if, I see. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't. I don't know. Um, I guess Sotheby's would have a record of that. Yeah. Anybody else with a last chance? There's one more that just popped up. Uh, no, actually, a couple of them. Will the show be produced again soon? I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 you know, I hope, I definitely want the show to be produced in that version. I, I am working on a puppet version of it. Um, so, but it'll be different. So yeah, um, but I would love to, we want a production here in New York. It's a, it's a very unique New York story. It needs to be told here and maybe one day um, a producer will be brave enough to take it on. Uh, there's also one question about where and when is the production on Broadway? Uh, um, <laughs> Soon. <laughs> I'll let I'll let Harley take answer that. <laughs> but but not not soon enough. I would I'd be heading over to the Lunt Fontaine right now if we could. I would. All of you should come. Someday, Alba, we really hope that will happen. This is the end of our serious play tonight. Um, so I want to thank, thank everybody for coming. And bye, Deirdre, Lisa, Liz, Debbie, Stephanie Jones, Aunt Jessie, Adrian, Corrine. Thank you. Thank you all. 
Thank, Thank you. you. It was a wonderful <laughs> evening. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for coming, everyone. Susan, thank you for coming. Lori, Lori, you're in Fez. Um, thank you, Alva. Oh, Robert, Robert. <laughs> Where are you, Robert? <laughs> can't hear you. Deborah Neff is still here. I am fangirl. Thank you for coming. <laughs> thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Brenna. Uh, thank you, Mark. So yeah, so um, I hope everyone will have a lovely and healthy holiday season. Thank you. As we said, this evening has been recorded. You will find it at franklinfurnace.org in just about a week. <laughs> and we invite you to sign up for our mailing list for once a week emails with events not like this there's nothing like this but we work with a lot of gutsy artists and scholars and we wish to keep you in our midst so thank you for coming out and alba and paula you're the best you you really did it thank you thank you have a good night and let me take one 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 last a uh, screenshot of everyone. If you could please smile. I want to post this tomorrow. Thank you so much for being here. Have a good night. Good night.